Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Doug Olenek, and I am the online editor for SC Media and your moderator for this program, which is sponsored by Cisco. Our topic today is how threat intelligence is streamlining security operations. Our speakers are Dr. Dia Majub, Principal Engineer of Security Research with the Cisco Umbrella Team, Daniel Hathaway, Senior Technical Analyst with Recorded Future, and Athena Altiar, Product Marketing Manager on the Cisco Umbrella Team. Figuring out that your corporation has been hit with a cyber attack is always job one for cybersecurity professionals. But just as important is being able to quickly respond to that problem. One way to do so is to obtain as much actionable intelligence as possible from your data so you can react quickly to the threat. Our speakers today will explain how to accelerate incidents, incident response and streamline security operations. And now with that said, I would like to turn the show over to Athena. Great. Thank you, Doug. As he mentioned, I'm Athena, a product marketing manager on the Cisco Umbrella team, joined by our two researchers, Dia and Daniel. So in this next hour, our two renowned security researchers will share a couple use case stories that will highlight how the integration between recorded future and investigate can help you gain a complete view of threats and a streamlined security operations to its utmost efficiency. After, I'll be moderating a Q&A segment and picking their brain about incident response best practices. So with no further ado, let me introduce our two speakers. Dr. Dia Majoub and Daniel Hathaway. So let's start with Dia. Do you mind sharing a little about yourself, your position, and your most prominent work? Thank you, Athena. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be on this call, in fact. Uh, I'm Dia Majoub. I'm the principal engineer of uh, Cisco Umbrella Research. I run the core research team who focuses on large-scale threat detection and threat intelligence. Um, in the past, I worked on computer networks and security for over a decade in academia and industry, and I have a PhD in graph algorithms uh, applied on uh, wireless sensor networks. And with my team, as I mentioned, we work on powering the products that uh, Cisco Umbrella uh, offers to their customers. Great, thank you. Now, Daniel, do you mind sharing a little about yourself and your work? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Hathaway, and uh, again, I'm a senior threat intelligence analyst at uh, Recorded Future. Um, basically, the team I work at is uh, we uh, use our product and we look for uh, uh, new types of malware and new techniques that they use, as well as uh, looking for different actors and kind of their motivations. Um, on top of that, we do a lot of uh, just threat hunting, looking for all of that stuff as well. But uh, I've been in the security space for about nine years. Uh, I've worked in uh, a couple different industries from uh, energy to finance and now technology, and I'm lucky enough to have a, a hobby that's my job, uh, which makes it uh, super enjoyable. So I look forward to uh, sharing with you guys. Great. Well, thank you both. We're very excited to get, for you guys to be on the line. And before we dive into the integration, let's just briefly go over the core capabilities of each of our products. So Cisco Umbrella Investigate, or Investigate for short, provides the most complete view of the relationships and evolutions of domains, IPs, autonomous systems, and file hashes via a web-based console or an API. So Investigate leverages a live graph database of DNS requests and other contextual data from Cisco Umbrella's 85 million active users across the world. We then take this massive amount of data and apply machine learning models to it. This helps us score and actually predict malicious domains and IPs. And ultimately, this rich threat intelligence adds the context needed to uncover and predict threats. Now, what differentiates Investigate from other security solutions is that it brings together many pieces of information in a single correlated source. For instance, we provide historical information with a passive DNS database, and our Who is Record data shows who registered a domain and what other domains were registered by that same person. There's also a lot of different types of anomaly, anomaly detection and reputation scores. 
So typically during incident response, organizations would need to get all of this information from many scattered places, which you can guess is time consuming and only shows one piece of the puzzle. Then they're left to figure out the correlations and connections manually. Instead, they can leverage Investigate's aggregate intelligence as a primary place they go to hunt imminent threats and get a complete picture of an attack. Now passing and it to Daniel. Future. Recorded Future delivers uh, threat intelligence through uh, machine learning and natural language processing, which basically turns raw data into actionable data. Um, our uh, breadth of coverage ranges over 20 billion data points, which uh, we boil down into three distinct categories of uh, open source, technical source, and closed source. Um, open source is uh, anything available on the web ranging from uh, free threat list to social media posts, uh, pay sites, uh, security researchers, and so on. Uh, technical sources are any type of source that we collect and then we enrich and enhance that process on our own. Uh, and then closed source is anything that's actually behind TOR, uh, criminal forms that require uh, vetted access um, and that sort of uh, space. So with this exciting integration between Investigate and Recorded Futures different streams of intelligence, you're actually able to be completely agile during threat investigations and triage. So this means that you and your team can actually start your hunt or incident response with a single indicator of compromise, such as a domain, IP, ASN, email address, or file hash. Or you can even search your very own brand name or concentrated topic. And by drawing on the behavior analysis from billions of global threat incidents, you can get the customized, context-driven threat intelligence you need to fully understand a threat, enabling you to investigate and to respond to threats much faster and much more efficiently. Now let's see uh, this integration really in action. So Dia and Daniel actually prepared three use cases that will explore what kind of rich intelligence is available in both products and how they work together to build really the most complete view of threats. Starting with a vulnerability example. Excellent. So when you uh, first log into the Recorded Future console, you are basically seeing what we call threat land. It's basically uh, threat views, which is a threat landscape, uh, which quickly shows items that are currently being talked about on all of our different sources that we talked about earlier. Um, as part of my research, though, I uh, you know, rely on the, the work that others have done. Um, in particular, with this example that we're going to talk about here, uh, FireEye did a report on CVE 2017-0199, uh, which caught my eye because this particular uh, CVE, when successful, allows for remote code execution on uh, specific versions of Microsoft Office. So when you search that CVE number um, within, the, within the search window, you are presented with uh, an Intel card. Uh, these Intel cards are living content that change as the references, are, as references are added or more indicators are identified. Uh, the full card, we really couldn't fit on the page, but uh, we're going to highlight each uh, uh, content piece within it uh, as we go through this example. Um, Recorded Future had this uh, vulnerability rated as very critical since we first saw it around April the 11th. Uh, this is primarily because we were able to identify uh, a lot of different threat researchers actually, you know, writing about this vulnerability, uh, but also we could see uh, criminals talking about it on closed sources. Um, you'll also notice below that when we polled uh, uh, NIST that there was actually no rating at the time that it was polled. And there is now, uh, they updated theirs about uh, April 20th to a 9.3 out of 10, which is uh, very critical. Um, so it just kind of shows that uh, by using our sources, we are able to, uh, you know, kind of predict what ratings are going to be as well. We also keep a, kind of a trend count of an entity that you're searching, in this case, the CVE. 
Um, it's kind of hard to tell because the screenshot's not really interactive, but if you put your mouse over these bars, you'll actually see the date um, and the frequency of that they're talked about. And you can kind of see in this picture here that uh, everything started blowing up about April the 11th, and that's when you see um, all these spikes, and it goes up really high, and then it kind of slowly starts trending down to where we're at today. Uh, this view is really cool when it comes to attacks that tend to spike up and down. Um, a good example of one that does that a lot is Scanbox. This is a list of just kind of all the references uh, in regards to the CVE number. Um, you can see there's uh, people talking about it on Twitter. There's uh, researchers talking about it. And there's also a, uh, a dark web reference below from uh, one of the criminal forums. I just kind of wanted to, to make sure that everyone could see that uh, the references come up on the Intel cards as well. And if you keep going down on the Intel card, you'll see uh, something called context. And what this really is, is it's uh, all other indicators in the source that you're looking at. So um, if, you're, if it's a blog post, it gets all the other IPs and domains and hashes that are mentioned on that page, and it kind of puts it here. So we can, we can clearly see that the attack vector below is, you know, a lot of people mentioned it with zero day. Um, a lot of people mentioned it with backdoor. And you have all these different file hashes associated with it. Um, but we're going to, uh, you know, use this IP list to find an additional pivot point. And uh, if we click on the IP that 95.141.38.110, uh, we'll be presented with another Intel card. And again, uh, we presented uh, with another Intel card, and it has the same information as before as a CVE card, but now it's specific to IP uh, entity type. And you can see that we uh, also have this one marked as malicious based on the references and, uh, and stuff that we were able to collect on the IP. Um, the last reference on this particular uh, entity uh, is from a website called hackingdig.com, and you can see it's been translated from Chinese to English. Um, However, uh, no matter how great the Intel cards are, there is always uh, more specialized data that we can pivot from, and that's when we want to use our extensions, and in this case, uh, the Cisco umbrella, to actually get more technical information about that uh, particular IP address. And uh, if you see here, this is kind of what happens when we click on the extension uh, for that IP address within our Intel card. We actually uh, pull the data back from uh, Cisco Umbrella, and you can see we get uh, a quick view within the same product, um, a look at the uh, prefixes, the ASNs, the network owner, um, the hashes, and, uh, you know, you can see that the AV detection there was exactly for the CVE we were looking at, so we have almost a complete full circle there. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over. Thanks, Daniel. So as we can see here, if you pivot into uh, – Umbrella Investigate, uh, we see that the IP uh, actually is associated with the sample, uh, the one that has a threat score of 95. So that comes from the uh, threat grid integration. And more specifically, we can see that the, uh, the, the sample is associated with the RTF exploit, the rich uh, text uh, uh, format, which is like one of the Word document formats. And uh, we also see the label CVE 2017-0199. So that kind of completes the story uh, that Daniel was uh, explaining earlier by using Recorded Future. Uh, furthermore, if we move forward, we can see that the, uh, the next, uh, I would say, screen shows us more context about that uh, sample. So we can see when it was uh, first seen. We have a few more kind of scores for severity on some of the artifacts that came in the, in the file. Uh, so this is basically uh, having that complete view into uh, a CVE that was picked up by some uh, unstructured uh, data, like by scraping the open or closed web. And then you can pivot into technical intel uh, via Cisco Umbrella and uh, ThreatGrid. Great, and the next use case will be a concurrent investigation from an IP. So not all the time do you have to pivot into um, recorded future 
and then gain more access and to investigate. But you also can just do parallel in investigations to gain a better picture of an attack starting from an IP. Absolutely. So, for example, in, in the life or the day job of a uh, threat analyst or researcher, oftentimes you're kind of having these parallel tracks uh, to collect, analyze, and, and process uh, intelligence to come up with the right, uh, uh, I guess, information to make decisions. So in this case, uh, we picked up this IP. In fact, this IP happens to be uh, uh, hosting uh, some gate for exploit kits. Uh, in the first screen, we can see that this IP is hosted on this uh, ASN 51852, which is a Swiss ASN. Uh, furthermore, we can see that that ASN, in fact, is having some suspicious, uh, I would say, patterns. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of research about bulletproof hosting providers and, uh, I would say, rogue hosting uh, entities. And this one, in fact, has its servers in Switzerland but then the business registration is in an offshore jurisdiction, which is Panama. Uh, I invite you to check some of our previous work about what we call like offshore uh, jurisdiction um, bulletproof hosting providers, where you have a lot of these uh, hosting companies that will register their business in, let's say, Belize, uh, Panama, uh, Anguilla, Antigua. Uh, some of these countries where um, you are basically immune to any law enforcement action and uh, that will facilitate you offering hosting for criminals. So in case uh, you get abuse complaints, then you can just say, hey, the company, the country where my company is registered does not respond to these uh, complaints. So you're basically uh, kind of off the hook about these things. Now, if we move forward, we can see that uh, one of the domains hosted on that IP is vcalls.pw. So we can kind of pivot into the domain now. And uh, what we did is that we tagged that as a browser redirect. Since we mentioned earlier, it's a, a gate to uh, exploit kits that are being leveraged at the moment, like in the past few days. And the other very interesting feature here in Investigate, at least visually, is the traffic pattern. So here we can see that there were the earliest spikes or uh, anomalous queries we saw were back in, uh, on April the 11th. And that's actually even earlier than some of the mentions in the open web uh, about this uh, IP and domain. So that kind of uh, shows you the power of this uh, predictive uh, threat intel that we offer here with our global visibility into DNS and IP space. We also show that the domain is uh, hosted on a suspicious prefix score, and we already blocked it in our umbrella blacklist. If we go deeper, we can see that the domain, in fact, uh, shows like a recent registration. So it was registered on April the 2nd, 2017. So think about it this way. The domain was registered on April the 2nd, 2017. The first spike was on April the 11th. And then the uh, first mentions in the, I would say, uh, security community was about uh, the 14th, uh, I think. So that's kind of the, the timeline that you can monitor uh, with this type of technology. Now, what we care about here is the email. In fact, this email has been used to register a few or like a, another set of malicious uh, domains. If we check them uh, in further detail, we'll see that they uh, span like some carding forums, uh, porn sites, and a few other uh, fake software. Like one of them, in fact, is Adobe Flash Player. So that's a fake uh, Flash Player uh, website. And then if we look uh, at the bottom, we can also um, work on the name server entities here. So NS1 to NS4 QHoster.net. In fact, QHoster.net is this uh, rogue hosting company that is uh, registered in Bulgaria, but they also have IP space in a variety of countries. Um, some of it is in Panama and a few other uh, offshore uh, countries. Uh, think about it this way. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of these hosting companies, they will diversify their IP space, and they will try to evade uh, takedowns and abuse complaints by registering their business in these offshore jurisdictions. Uh, furthermore, if you uh, take a look at the uh, screenshot of the website, uh, one of the other uh, features that we, that we look for when we research these bulletproof hosting providers is the payment methods. In the center, you can see that they allow you to use perfect money in Bitcoin, 
which are one of among the anonymous uh, payment methods on the internet. We're not saying they're like uh, all for criminal purposes, but then they are highly abused by by rogue customers. So that's kind of one of those other indicators you can look for uh, to kind of uh, understand the landscape of these bulletproof hosting companies. So now going back into uh, you know using the same IP address in a recorded future, that's one uh, the thirty one seven sixty three one eighty six. You can see that we also have it marked as malicious and. Uh, as he was stating, uh, you know, our first or the last reference we saw was April the 14th, which happened to come from a malware researcher, um, basically discussing that it was uh, an exploit that he was looking at. Um, the first reference we had was of 2014 uh, from a paste bin site, which um, I believe that's just uh, you know IPs can get reused, uh, reused and uh, different uh, you know reassigned as as uh, as they age. So uh, a lot of these older references like this will age out of the risk score. Um, that's why you're not seeing that one in there. And if you look at the uh, actual context of this particular uh, uh, IP address that we're looking at, you can see that we have it uh, you know, marked as an exploit kit, uh, the RIG exploit kit specifically. Uh, it also has the, uh, the vicals.pw domain. Um, which was all, all found within the uh, malware re uh, reference uh, from the researcher there. So our final use case is starting from a security trend. So in this case, uh, let's take this scenario. Uh, let's say you work at a bank or a financial institution, and either your manager or yourself, uh, let's say you are a security or a threat analyst or researcher, and uh, you guys heard about these uh, breaches, uh, and you're kind of worried about your data. Are some of the data of your bank or financial institution being offered in the underground? And what you want to do is kind of go and uh, use these two technologies, either recorded future or, or investigate, to find out if there are any, uh, any discussions or any kind of domains or IPs that are hosting um, marketplaces offering these stolen uh, credentials or credit cards. So what we're looking at here is a, uh, a recorded future search over the course of a year, I believe, for uh, a particular um, author who has been uh, making lots of public, uh, you know, postings saying that he's selling credit cards. Uh, his uh, name is actually uh, Master CBV, uh, who also tends to be um, operating his own uh, sites. But you can see this is just kind of the references. And now what, what I wanted to kind of point out was you can actually see the, the spike within his post, all starting with around, I believe that's March, and it just completely spikes up uh, really, really quickly. If you were to click on one of those references, you can see that it is uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, he's actually marketing his site to sell uh, credit cards and CVVs on uh, on other people's websites um, who are known for this as well. And this particular example was from uh, April the 18th on uh, on uh, cardmafia.ws, and he's uh, the title of the post was actually uh, mastercvv.ru. Um, you know, so he's, uh, you know, talking about the services that he's provided um, for everyone to kind of give click through and look at. And you can see he also has a lot of his other domains that, which are back up to his main, the master cvv.in, the master cvv1.ru, and so forth. And this is just a good example of um, how we collect the data from these criminal forms and how they can be used to, to kind of you know, look at the information that's on there without actually having to visit or actually be vetted to go into these sites. In fact, when we uh, take a look at the actual website, this is how it looks like. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, we have three websites. Uh, we see this trend uh, quite often where uh, one site will have a couple more or a few more uh, websites as redundancy or fault tolerance in case one of them gets taken down or if it's not available. Uh, we can see here that they're offering uh, stolen credit cards um, in a variety, from a variety of countries. 
And the interesting thing is that when we use investigate, we will see that this is a uh, website being visited by humans because you can see the periodic traffic pattern here. This is like the one of the most interesting features we, we you can kind of uh, leverage with investigate because uh, we don't see spikes that are uh, reminiscent of, let's say, botnet C2s or uh, some sites that just like uh, all of a sudden show up on the internet. MasterCVV.in happens to be a popular uh, marketplace or dump shop where people go there either to consult what's available or to maybe buy uh, these stolen credentials or credit cards. Um, you can see kind of the amount of traffic at any given time in the day and it follows that kind of uh, the day and night kind of uh, periodicity uh, for a uh, popular site. Uh, the other interesting thing is that this uh, domain or mastercv.in is hosted on a uh, fast flux infrastructure. Uh, if we look into the name servers, uh, we find out that it's using the ddosguard.net infrastructure. ddosguard.net, in fact, is one of the renowned bulletproof hosting companies. They, the way they advertise themselves in the open web or like in the public, they claim they are like this uh, DDoS protection company, so you can kind of protect your uh, domains or assets, online assets, by using their service uh, so you wouldn't be hit by some adversaries or some uh, competitors. But in reality, these are, um, I would say, rogue or criminal uh, actors who are operating this uh, hosting company. In fact, last year at Black Hat 2016, we gave a quite detailed presentation about bulletproof hosting uh, providers uh, that we investigated from the network and the underground perspective, and a DDoS card was one of the use cases we, we explained. Now, let's take a look at uh, another feature of Investigate that is quite useful here, which is the co-occurrences or related domains. In fact, these two uh, models are quite similar. They just have a few kind of technical differences, but for the sake of the discussion, we'll say that they are the same. So for related domains, we can see that there's this site, openssource.info. This uh, domain happens to be co-occurring with mastercvv.in. Really quick, what co-occurrences means is that a lot of client IPs have been querying the same uh, two domains during a short time period. So that kind of explains, or at least uh, translates, uh, or expresses that people are interested in the same uh, themes or, or topics by visiting these uh, two sites uh, at the same time. Co-occurrences is quite useful, actually, for another use case, which is infected machines calling out uh, botnet C2s or DGA domains, because you'll see a lot of these infected machines querying uh, a long uh, range of domains during a very short time period. For today, we're going to discuss opensource.info. Interestingly, this site is a forum where uh, you have people discussing a variety of crimeware services. So they start by having a mention of master CVV at the top. That's the site where we uh, started from. And then we can see that they offer banners for SOC services. This is basically for proxy services to kind of hide you and, and uh, guarantee privacy if you're trying to do some legitimate or legal activities. Uh, we also see some uh, other offers for um, dump shops and also uh, instaplus.mu uh, or net, which is a way for you to buy fake followers. In fact, if we move forward by checking Investigate uh, really quick, we can see that, again, this is a popular site that is visited uh, by humans because we can see a periodic pattern in terms of uh, uh, traffic. And then we can see a few spikes uh, every once in a while. More interestingly, if we look at the co-occurrences, we see this website called assetbot.ru. And now think about it this way. We started from a carding trend, we went into this uh, forum that was advertising uh, a more diverse set of crime or services, and now we're jumping into assetbot.ru, which happens to be a website where you can buy uh, fake social media followers. Uh, we can see here that they're offering followers on VK, VK, VK which is, uh, I guess, the Russian uh, LinkedIn or Facebook, and then we can have uh, we can f uh, buy uh, fake Twitter followers or Instagram uh, followers. 
So this is kind of interesting because you can have a, an amplification effect of a variety of crime or services or rogue services, I would say, starting from like a very, uh, like a, from an initial seed in your investigation. And this is important because sometimes you don't want to be that reactive. You want to understand the, the threat landscape and kind of figure out what uh, look, look, the crimeware scene is offering in terms of services and, and products and, and goods for, uh, for, for like the, uh, the community on the Internet. Great. So thanks, Dan and Dana, for walking us through those three use cases. And I hope that you can see that with this integration, it really allows for a lot of flexibility during your incident response and threat hunting. And it really all depends on your organization's security needs. So from examples one walkthrough, you can actually pivot from a vulnerability to an IP to a file hash to understand maybe how a piece of malware is infiltrating a network. Or simply just build out your understanding of the attacker's internet infrastructure that's being leveraged. You can even pivot from the ASN to the domain to expand your scope of research and uncover associated domains that were tied to the same email registry. Or just get a better understanding into where a certain IP or domain is hosted on and the reputation of its name server. But through this really agile approach, uh, you see that the possible pivot points of this integration is seemingly endless, and it's really valuable when trying to understand how attacker infrastructure is related. So moving along to the Q&A portion, as the threat landscape rapidly evolves and putting our networks in very vulnerable positions, a lot of organizations really struggle with effective incident response. So at this time, I'd like to ask Dia and Daniel some questions about their opinions on IR best practices and how this integration might mitigate those challenges. So my first question is, with the rising cost of cybersecurity products and the difficulty in evaluating their effectiveness, what are the premium differentiators between investigate and recorded feature? And how do they work together to improve security and provide a unified protection? Uh, so the way our data. Oh, sorry. Oh, go okay. ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I'll I'll describe a little bit our perspective from the Cisco Umbrella Investigate team. Um, in fact, I would say the visibility we have uh, worldwide. Uh, think about it. We have a presence in 25 data centers on five continents. Uh, that allows us to have 85 million clients every day, up to 90 billion DNS lookups uh, on a daily basis. And so practically, there's, there isn't any threat that happens that involves DNS or IP that we, we don't see. And, uh, th but that kind of adds the problem of the a needle in a haystack. And that's why like the, the work of the research team here becomes very fundamental because we have all of these, uh, I would say, models that are both deterministic and machine learning based. So deterministic in the sense we have some models that will uh, look for exploit kits from the analysis of the uh, websites, the compromised websites, the redirection uh, schemes, the gates, etc. And then we have the machine learning approaches that are mostly based on traffic analysis and hosting IP uh, space monitoring. So traffic analysis involves mostly kind of metadata. You're looking at these anomalies and these patterns in terms of queries coming from infected machines going to these specific websites. So well, the mix here is uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised will mean that you have to have labeled data. So that brings in like the expertise of threat analysts to kind of label whether this domain is exploit kits, ransomware, botnet, phishing, et cetera. And then uh, based on that, you can kind of train your classifiers to uh, make accurate detections. The unsupervised here is, again, about finding these patterns. So you can go like uh, into this clustering uh, approach where you try to put things together in terms of, let's say, hosting infrastructures, uh, uh, registration uh, via email, um, the traffic pattern in terms of kind of uh, domains are being queried during the short time period together. So I believe uh, the kind of the, the breadth of all of these approaches allows you to have uh, this perspective into the uh, uh, technical threat intelligence landscape uh, with Investigate. 
And Recorded Future, I believe, will complement that uh, quite uh, like efficiently. Yeah, and, and, you know, the way that, you know, our data sets are quite, you know, are quite a bit different, which is what makes this partnership uh, so beneficial. Um, you know, having the ability uh, in Recorded Future to search and correlate on all the threat-centric data with our 20 billion data points, and then further enriching that data with, uh, with the extensions, and in this particular case, the Cisco umbrella, is really uh, pretty phenomenal. And, it, it, you know, I hope the examples today highlighted that. But when you think about the, uh, the speed and efficiency it could bring to your team, it's, uh, it, it's really nice. One other thought here is that uh, threat intelligence comes in, I would say, at least two ways. So you have unstructured and structured. So unstructured is your human discussions and forums, blogs, uh, pace. So that's kind of what Recorded Future does, and that's their forte. Structured is uh, all the technical IOCs and, and telemetry that we collect and analyze and process with the uh, um, Cisco umbrella, meaning like domains, IPs, uh, routing tables, SSL scans, uh, malware hashes. So kind of the unified view is quite compelling here um, for, the, for the user. Great, and on to the broader topic of incident response. So what are your best practices for triaging? Daniel, do you want to take it? Sure, so, uh, you know, when dealing with an incident that actually elevates to the need of, you know, actually having some sort of actual real response, it's, it's always best, in my mind, to have a formal uh, documented plan, uh, which kind of walks through, you know, all the different steps of, uh, you know, the preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. Uh, as much as us technical junkies, you know, despise hearing the word, you know, process and formally wrote out, um, it, it definitely does help when you're actually, you know, in, in the heat of an incident um, and actually, you know, keeps people from panicking um, when all that kind of is hitting the fan at some point in time. So, you know, I would... Uh, I would say one of the best steps to do is actually take the time, uh, sit down, and actually have a formal plan for that. I would also highly recommend training for your teams um, in incident response, as well as um, you know conducting some exercises in order to keep uh, you and your team um, you know sharp. That way, you know uh, who you're going to contact when you need to um, you know pull you know something from. Uh, an Active Directory server versus, uh, you know, some other, you know, technology that's not usually under the um, umbrella of uh, a security team. Yeah, I totally agree with Daniel. Uh, I would add that uh, for, for, for an organization, the key thing here to start with is that you have that awareness about yourself and visibility into your assets. So, for instance, um, alerts or, or events, I would say events that can become alerts and then incidents, uh, they will come from a variety of sources. So they can come from the perimeter, the network, the endpoint, the application. They might be violations of policies. So all of those kind of entry points, I would say, for potential uh, threats, they have to be uh, accounted for. So for example, you might be seeing alerts coming from your firewall or coming from your endpoint uh, because some application that is suspicious is being installed. Maybe you see some rogue process trying to overwrite another process's uh, memory space, or you might see someone trying to, let's say, access a file from a USB drive, which is against your policies. Or finally, maybe someone is trying to access some files or data that is not within his, uh, I would say, uh, uh, user access uh, policies. So all of these things actually should be uh, known by all of the uh, members of the SOC team or the IR team. And based on that, we can kind of assign priorities. In fact, when you uh, get these uh, alerts, you'll have to verify if they're worth investigating or like at least escalating. And then you'll have to classify them into priority levels. And then you'll assign them to someone to take care of. Uh, so sometimes some of them will just like be very uh, low importance. For example, someone is probing you and doing like some scans on, on, on your external systems. and Sometimes it might be someone trying to find vulnerabilities into your web, web server or like your, your database. Uh, so I guess the awareness and understanding of your, uh, I would say, uh, assets and the tight kind of uh, collaboration between your, your team 
members is, is crucial here to be able to uh, apply these best practices. And the next question, for organizations that don't have a defined incident response process or team, what are some good first steps to start one, and what should they be looking for when building a team and creating a strong process? So kind of yeah. going to what was discussed, yeah, so kind of going to what was just discussed recently, um, in my opinion, uh, visibility is, is key. Uh, I would start by determining uh, where you do and where you do not have adequate visibility on both your host and your network. Um, in my experience, it's hard to come back to management and ask for a larger budget for some new uh, technology or headcount uh, when you're not able to speak in all aspects of your organization. Um, with that, you know, a lot of organizations uh, look at building their own internal capability for incident response. Um, some organizations, you know, don't want to be bothered with this. Uh, you know, maybe they have a hard time finding and or retaining talent, so they outsource it to a uh, provider. Um, others uh, do kind of a hybrid uh, where they have an incident response team, but they also have a vendor that they keep on standby when uh, an incident needs to be uh, escalated to them. Uh, whichever model uh, your organization uh, uses, it still requires that visibility because you know, an outsourced uh, company is still going to need to have that same level of visibility to be able to, you know, detect and actually respond to these incidents. So, uh, again, I would still say uh, visibility is uh, probably your, a good starting point when you're looking to uh, start your IR team. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with Daniel. Uh, I guess to echo what he just said is it's either you want to have it as in-house or outsourcing, and each has its pros and cons. So in-house is when you don't want to bother with any of this. Uh, I'm sorry, in-house when you want to bother with this and you want to have it uh, assigned to your internal teams. Uh, in that case, you'll have to have the budget, the, uh, I would say, the blessing of the executives. You'll have to have the uh, headcount, so you'll have to look for talent, like Daniel mentioned. Um, so it involves a lot of, I would say, overhead However, you have total control over uh, on everything, and um, that that's kind of very important sometimes, especially if you work in it's like a critical or sensitive uh, industry. The outsourcing here is can be another very interesting option because there are a lot of MSSPs uh, out there that can, that can offer you a, a SOC kind of service, uh, but make sure here that your SLAs will kind of uh, uh, be well defined. So especially that especially that uh, the, the MSSP will have access to some, you know, sensitive uh, data about your uh, company or your customers. Um, there's also the advantages uh, of the, the MSSP having access to a lot more uh, threat intelligence feeds, so he might have the budget, the MSSP might have the budget to acquire a lot more uh, sources. And finally, uh, if the MSSP has, like, a good customer base, then you can take advantage of the, their visibility into other uh, companies in the same industry. Let's say if you're like in the fi financial kind of sector, banking, uh, healthcare, uh, oil and gas, so they might kind of uh, help you benefit from all of that uh, knowledge uh, coming from other, uh, I would say, uh, customers in the same uh, uh, segment. Great. And for our last question, so what third-party security products do we see customers using Recorded Future and Investigate with, and how do they fit into a SOC team processes? Uh, this is Daniel, and, and sure, uh, in addition to having, you know, Recorded Future data directly into your SIM, whether it be ArcSight, Splunk, QRadar, kind of pick your vendor, uh, we have a a lot of customers who integrate our data um, directly into analytic tools like Multigo, uh, automation tools like Phantom, and others. As, aside from those workflows, you know, we also have the extensions, which we demoed today, which, again, allow those customers to uh, view all the contextual data uh, from a technical indicator in one place and one format um, instead of having to bounce around between different tools. Uh, we also have a browser extension that we see uh, gets, gets used frequently which basically allows a uh, researcher to, you know, click on a indicator 
uh, within a web page and it directly opens up um, into one of our, our into our Intel cards. So I think that's kind of where we're at currently. Yeah, and um, I guess from my side, the way I see it is, um, like you mentioned, like the SIM products are a key, um, I would say, products that take advantage of both Recorded Future and, and Cisco Umbrella Investigate. The other one is the threat intelligence platforms where you can kind of ingest all of these uh, threat intel sources and uh, prioritize uh, how they use them, how you kind of concentrate in a central point, uh, how to kind of uh, take advantage of them for enriching your, uh, your let's say, uh, detected threats. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, what we provide here with both products is, um, I guess, two perspectives, like I mentioned earlier. It's the unstructured uh, threat intel and then the structured. But then you want to uh, transcend the technical threat intel into operational. So by having uh, this knowledge and understanding of the threat landscape and the crimeware uh, patterns, and behaviors, you are able to be ahead of the uh, bad guy. So you don't have to always be reactive, just like catching these domains and IPs and kind of going and blocking them or adding rules or, or like signatures. You want to be able with your uh, team, especially if you have like some really talented threat hunters, to go and understand what's out there and oftentimes go and kind of browse the, let's say, the recorded future interface to find these trends, use investigate to kind of uh, observe patterns in bulletproof hosting uh, infrastructures, find like the fast flux uh, kind of networks. So that allows you to have this perspective and awareness that is very valuable to uh, transcend just like the reactive technical intelligence that, uh, that might be useful but is oftentimes uh, limiting if we just stick with it and don't go beyond that. Great, so thank you both Dee and Daniel, and we're just about to wrap it up. And if you want to try this integration, the only requirements are a recorded future license and an Investigate API. Um, for an Investigate demo, please email sales at opendns.com. And for recorded future, you can request it at go.recordedfuture.com slash demo. And if you're interested to learn more about the product separately, please feel free to visit the respective pages. And I'd also like to do a special highlight that Recorded Future posted a Partner Spotlight blog on the Cisco Umbrella Investigate integration. So be sure to check that out as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. And I'm passing it back to you, Doug. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, as was said, that will have to be it for today. Our thanks to Deha and Daniel for their presentation and to Cisco for sponsoring the program. And of course, thanks to all of you for taking part. I would also like to remind our audience that this webcast will be available shortly at www.scmagazine.com under the Events tab. With that, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.